Cool. Yeah, like I said, we're going to be going over objects and how to package your code today in libraries and what a library means in terms of Python. Um, so first thing, I would like to ask if there are any questions about functions, uh, common data structures, list tuples, dictionaries, input output, Pygame events, or other general Python questions. Do you guys have any like questions from your homework that you want to bring up or anything like that? So we kind of went over this, but I want to make sure I understand. Shoot. A list is pretty much the same as an array in other languages. Yes, but a list is stretchy. A list is stretchy? Yes. You can, um, so if you're using a statically typed language like Java or C, you need to define the number of elements that are going to be contained within your array prior to filling it, right? So you would say, I want an array of 10 integers. And you could only store 10 integers within that array. In Python, one, it doesn't care about the data types that go into it. And two, it can be as big as you want. And you can stretch it on the fly. Um, so yes and no. Right? That's the main difference, is that it's stretchy and it can contain arbitrary data types. But it, it functions similar to an array. Exactly. Yeah, you cannot modify the innards of a tuple. It will try and yell at you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from any of the previous classes? No? All right. You could reassign the whole tuple to uh, sure. that once, but yes. you can't individually. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You cannot manipulate the individual elements that are contained within a tuple, but you can reassign the tuple. So if we wanted to do something like, let me make this bigger really quick. Profiles, um, edit. How do I feel about 16? I think that sounds great. Um, so if we have a tuple, one, two, three, right? And we try and do a tuple zero equals five, it's going to give us an error. But if we do a tuple equals five, six, seven, it doesn't care. And the reason it doesn't care is because you're creating an entirely new tuple and just using the same bucket that you were using before, right? It's the same variable, it's not the same tuple. That makes sense to everyone? No. No? What doesn't make sense? Did that overwrite the other one? Yes. No. Yes, a it did. A tuple sub-zero is no longer one. Correct. A tuple sub-zero oh, is five. Mm -hmm. Any other questions there? No? We're good? Awesome. All right. So today, we're going to go over some extra dictionary examples because they weren't in the slides from last class. Bummer. Um, we're going to talk about classes and objects, uh, specifically structs and classes, um, and then objects, which are related to classes, and how they differ. And then we're going to talk about libraries and modules and packages, which are all ways of storing Python code in very organized ways. Um, so first things first, right? We remember dictionaries. We remember dictionaries are surrounded with curly braces. Um, and we can put keys, arbitrary keys, into a dictionary. Uh, you can load them on the fly. So you can do an A test equals 1, B equals 2. Keys can be arbitrary things. You can have like 18 be a key, and the uh, value be a string. Um, a dot items is going to give you a list that contains tuples of the key value pairs. Um, a dot keys is going to give you a list of all of the keys that are contained within the dictionary. A dot values is going to give you the values in a list. And uh, you can check for let me just pull up a terminal, right? So we have a equals this, a test equals one, b, or a, b equals two. What else did I have? 18 equals two, that's great. 18 equals two, right? So if we do a dot items, we get a list of tuples. Each one of the elements within that list is a tuple of the key value pairs. Um, we do keys. We get all of the keys. 
Uh, again, order is not guaranteed when you use a dictionary. It's never going to be sorted, or it will be sorted, but in a way that you don't expect, and then a way that you cannot count on. Um, we do values. We get all of the values out of our dictionary, right? And this is what our dictionary looks like. We can also do uh, test in A, and what that does is it checks to see whether or not the key test is contained within your dictionary. So if we do C in A, it's going to return as false. What else do we cover? It's only testing on the keys, not the values. Correct. Yeah, so if I did uh, B in A, that's a key. My bad. Um, but not 2 in A. Right. Exactly. Yeah, so it only, it only checks for, uh, for the keys. Um, I think you hung up on them. You want to go open that door? For, can someone go grab the door okay. to these folks? Thanks. Um, cool. Any other questions about dictionaries? No? Pretty solid on that. We, get, we see its usefulness. We see why you would use it in code and all sorts of other good things. Sweet. Um, so now I want to talk about classes. And classes are ways to store data and functions that work on that data specifically. Um, at its most basic, you can just use a, uh, a class to store a bunch of information. When you do that, it's called a struct, right? When you just like use a class to store variables, to store values, it's called a struct in so other languages. No, it's just nomenclature, right? So people will refer to... No, 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 no. So, um, I'm sorry. So a class is, right. So at the end of this slide, it says that there's never a good explanation for classes because it's always like really hard to explain and no one does it well. So I'm gonna go ahead and butcher it right now for you. Uh, a class is like a blueprint, basically, right? And this blueprint explains how to make something. And when you create an object, you're using the class to create one instance of whatever was on that blueprint, right? And there's a special case that functions the exact same way, where you only contain data and no functions within that. That's all I'm trying to illustrate here. Like that is called a structure or a struct. That comes from C. Because um, in C there are no objects, but there are structs where you can store arbitrary data. And every once in a while you hear someone refer to an object that has no functions, no methods attached to it, as a struct. Um, so but it's the same thing as an object. The class has to be returned in Correct. Yes. A class in of itself doesn't have data or functions. It just describes if you had one of them, what would be in it? Bingo. Okay. You got it. You got it. Um, Was that the good explanation? Do we have to say that? <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> well, it's on video now, so. Um, the class has a constructor in it that describes how the object is called mm -hmm. to instantiate Yeah, we'll talk about that. Um, Right, so at, its, at, at class is most complicated, you're going to have this whole thing where you can store data and functions that work on that data, and you can actually have like these classes relate to each other in like really interesting ways. Um, we're not gonna cover that because it's really complicated and weird, especially in Python, because um, they break a lot of the rules that other programming languages have set in place uh, for giggles. Um, so here's an example class, right? We're just gonna talk about this code really quick. The first thing you do when defining a class is use the keyword class. Then you name your class. Um, Python style says to always capitalize your class names. Um, and the open paren object close paren is not strictly necessary, um, but you should use it because this is the new Python class style. And what this just says is that it um, inherits some functions from like common objects. So there's like this abstract pure object that is in Python and this just pulls some of the features out of that and into your class. Um, we have an init function, uh, a dunder init. You'll hear those functions referred to as dunders, the ones with the two underbars in front of them. Um, what this does is it allows you to uh, create the class. So when you want to create an instance of a class, 
you would be calling this function, right? So you're actually going to say new paddle in order to create a new one, but it's behind the scenes going to call the init function. So you would pass it all of the arguments to that same init function in order to get it to run. So it's basically a way to call a whole bunch of functions at once. What is? Yeah, kind of. Um, but it also like contains this data in this like nice area, and all of those functions only work on the data that this one object contains. Does that help or hurt? So the I think I get it. All right. You're, as I understand, you're just call, when, when you're calling a class, you're calling a bunch of functions that are in a specific order and doing. But the, you're also calling the data, so you don't have to. Say, uh, for a paddle, I'm going to do all of these things that already know stacks. Mm -hmm. okay. I think about them as um, it just defines not just uh, what it's going to uh, have in it, but what it's going to do. So it's got functions and properties all wrapped up in one. Mm -hmm. It's a way to group things. Yep. yep, it's a way to group data and functions together. Um, so in this case, we're making a paddle, right, for our Pong game, because we're making Pong. Um, our constructor function, our init function, um, takes a bunch of arguments, the first one being self, right? Whenever you are writing a class, all of the methods within that class, the first argument has to be self. This is sloppy and weird. Most languages don't have this. Um, I don't particularly like it, I think it's a hack, but the benevolent dictator of Python decided that it was a great idea. Every time you define a function within a class, the first argument to that function needs to be self. Um, so other than that, we're getting the x and the y position of the paddle. We're going to get the uh, dy, which is going to be the speed in which this paddle moves in the uh, uh, y direction. And we're going to give it a color. The syntax here is something that I didn't show you before. This is a special syntax for functions. Uh, it's called a keyword argument. So you can actually put a bunch of keyword arguments and specify them in arbitrary orders as long as you put color in front of it or whatever the keyword is. Um, and the equals 255, 0, 255 just means that it's going to default to 255, 0, 255 if you don't pass it any color argument. Does that make sense to everyone? Just threw that in there just because it's fun. Um, what's up? How would you pass it in? This is when you're creating a new object. Only when you're creating a new Only object. When you're creating a new object. Mm -hmm. So this will take three or four arguments? You don't Correct. Have to write another constructor? Correct. This will take three or four arguments. And if you only give it three, then the last argument is going to be 255, 0, 255. Um, so in. Do you just like, leave an argument out and put two commas together? No, you don't need commas. So the way this would work, uh, if you were doing it, I don't have the class defined in here, but if we did paddle, uh, one, two, three, like this. That's how you would call it. You just skip the last one entirely. You so could. You have two, two at the end with defaults, and you want to skip the fourth one and specify the fifth one. Then you would have to use the, the keywords. Yeah, so if we had something like uh, def foo, uh, like uh, x, y, z, and then we had like an a equals five and a b equals six, right? Something like this. Yeah. And we wanted to use b but not a. Is that the question? Yeah. Um, right, we would call it like this, foo, one, two, three, because those are all required. You have to have those first three. If it's not a keyword argument, and if it's not defaulted, you have to have it or Python will yell at you. Um, then you would go ahead and do b equals three, just like that and you would skip the A argument entirely. And that would work, right? No errors there. It didn't do anything because there's no function body, but yeah, that's how you would call it. Um, any other questions on um, functions, keyword arguments, things like that? Cool, back to the class. Um, there are two methods associated with this class after the, well, let's talk about init more. So in the init method, we're setting a bunch of variables that are going to be specific to this object. So we're setting self.x to be equal to x. What that means is that 
this object is going to have an x value and we're going to set it to whatever we got the x argument, right? So that's what it's doing. So it's going to contain that x number inside of the object. Same with y, same with the speed and the color. And the width and the height we're just setting standard, so all paddles will have the same width and height. Um, there are two methods associated with this class. There is move and draw. Um, so you would do a paddle.move or a paddle.draw, depending on what you were doing. Um, both of these, again, you can see that self is being used as the first argument in both of those uh, methods. And then the second argument for move is an event. So it checks to see whether or not that event is a, a up arrow or a down arrow key press. And it will do the appropriate movement. And draw just takes a screen to draw on and then draws the paddle wherever it needs to go. Questions about this paddle class? We're going to see it in action in a little while. Uh, what's up? Can you, um, outside of this class, refer to it and say, like, um, paddle.self.x equals 30, and all of a sudden just throw it to 30? Sure. Yeah. yeah, except you would skip the self, right? You would just need to do okay. paddle.x, okay. and then you would do it. Okay. Um, where paddle is an instance, not a class. So you can't use big P paddle. You would have to use, you would have to create an instance of a paddle and then do paddle.x to change the x position on it. Uh, that is a little different than other programming languages. A lot of programming languages have uh, what's uh, private or protected or public scope. So that like tells you whether or not these data members are available to the public, like anyone running this code. Python, everything is public. You cannot hide things. Um, it just works that way. Like yeah. <laughs> um, exactly. Uh, that was another design decision. I'm not sure what went into that or why you would do that, but people seem to like it, and sometimes it simplifies things. Does that make security for it? Um, yes and no. So a lot of the times, when people write classes that protect data members, they're only doing it to protect from other folks who are writing code that interfaces with that. Um, so you can't do that as well in Python, but in terms of like, it does not affect whether or not your code is like exploitable. Like if someone can hack your computer based on that code, the fact that like a variable is public or private isn't gonna hurt that. It's only gonna hurt the execution of the program, if that makes sense. Did that answer your question? Cool. Any other questions about data members or methods? So the init is the constructor. The init is the constructor, yes. The init tells you how to make a new paddle. Mm -hmm. All functions that are defined within a class are called methods. They're really the exact same thing as a function, but they act upon the data that is contained within the class. Cool. So to initialize a paddle, to create paddles, you would do something like this. Paddle1 equals paddle, big P, and then you would pass it the arguments necessary to create it. Um, you would create a, a second paddle in a similar way, and this time it has the color in it. Um, the color doesn't have the keyword. You can do that as long as it's in the proper order. But if you try and throw things out of order, then you start need to use in start you need to use the keyword if you're going to specify parameters out of order. Um, and then just, these are uh, sample method calls. So paddle1.move is a method call. So you're saying, I want paddle1 to move, rather than just like moving some arbitrary paddle. Sorry, the e. It's an event. Yeah, so the move takes one argument, it takes an event, and it checks whether or not um, it's up or down. Questions on this at all? This is just a silly contrived example. Um, the demo code actually like shows what's going on, and it's a pretty complete Pong game. Cool. All right, so libraries. A library has allowed you to uh, separate your code in ways that's like nice and easy to read. So you can like break things out. So generally, you have one class per file, or you. You have a collection of functions that do similar things contained in one file. You can have multiple files be contained in one package, things like that. This is just like a really cool way of organizing your code, making sure things are simple and clean when you do uh, make a lot of code. Um, you guys have seen how to import code before. 
we've done import pygame to check to see whether or not pygame actually works a bunch. Um, that's a way of importing a file into Python or a package into Python in this case. Um, you've also seen from my module import star, that allows you to specify what things you want out of a package as opposed to just grabbing everything in its entirety. Um, there's a slight difference where you'll notice that if we do an import my module, then we have to do my module dot test. But if we just from my module import star, it will just pull everything into the same namespace. It won't like require you to prepend the my module. What's up? That's why you would use an import uh, as opposed to a from import. Um, so that way, presumably, your modules are named separately. Uh, so you would have like my module one and my module two, and you could do a my module one dot test versus a my module two dot test. But if you start doing a from my module import star sort of a situation, the latest one to be executed is going to override the other one. So you're only going to have one value. No. I believe it does that silently, yeah, which is really fun. So uh, try and avoid that. Um, right. So you can uh, take a bunch of Python code and stick it together in uh, something that's called a package. You just do this by creating a folder, making an empty underbar underbar init underbar underbar dot pi file in it, and then you can drop the rest of your code in there, and that that is what a package is, right? So in this case, we can go ahead and have like one overarching package. For example, Pygame is, is a package. And within Pygame, we have something called locals, right? We'd always do this like from pygame.locals import star after we import Pygame. What that is saying is that within the Pygame folder, there's another folder called locals or another file called locals, and everything in that file we want to import. Um, you can do this with files, you can do this with other packages as well, so you can have sub-packages, as long as it contains the structure where each one of the packages has this dunder init.py file, you can like use that folder as a package. Kind of weird, but if you continue to program in Python and actually like look into code that you'll see on like GitHub or things like that, this is the way everyone's going to do it. They're going to like distribute you this folder. This folder is going to contain a, a dunder init file in it and a bunch of Python code. And then hopefully a readme <laughs> to tell you how to actually use the things. But this is generally how Python is packaged. This is different from other languages. This is super Python specific. Um, but this is the way it does it. So the sub package underscore name is another folder inside there. Correct. Mm -hmm. Which has its own unique dunder init.py file. So to access that one, so if you did an import package name, then you would do package name dot sub package dot module three, and you could get it that way. Um, but you actually have to like use dots to move down through the package. Cool. All right. So one last time. Uh, this is. The first way is the normal way people import things. This is the suggested way to import things. This is the way that is not going to overwrite your stuff. Just doing a plain old import. So we do an import package name, package name dot module one dot test. So module one is a file that's contained within package name. So if we look back here, we have package name. We have module one. And within module one, there's some function called test. And this is how you would get at it if you were just doing a straight import. Um, if you wanted to get at the sub package and module three test, this is how you would chain it together. Um, so, it's a hypothetical function that would be in whatever these modules are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if we did a from package name import star, we wouldn't have to use package name dot module one. We could just use module dot or module one dot test to get at it. So. Can you rephrase that? Uh, well, if you're saying you don't have to tell it where module one.test is, 
as you're saying, like from package name and port star, like in here, I would like these things, these things, these exactly. things. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be a star. You can specify specific things. So what, is, what does star mean? Star means everything. It's a wild card. The same way you would do for like files and things on your computer. Um, but if we did a from uh, uh, pygame import local, right? We can do that. And then we have locals laying around, which is some module, right? So we can do that sort of thing. We can specify exactly what we want, or we can throw in a wild card to get everything. More questions? Not yet. All right, cool. Do, so, do people tend to just have one function per Python source file, or do they tend to put a whole bunch of functions into a single dot .py file? They tend to have a single class per dot .py file, or a collection of functions that do similar things. For example, math. If we wanted to import math functions, what that is implemented as is a, uh, it's a, a module that contains a bunch of math functions within that one module. So it's, yeah, more than one function. Does that answer your question? Yeah, because like, C, it's usually one function per dots. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yep. Cool. Yeah, and this last one is an example of importing something specific from um, a package. In this example here, from package name import sub package name, we would not be able to get a module one or module two. We could only get a sub package and whatever is contained within that. Um, it's kind of high level and kind of weird just because of the names I selected. But uh, you'll, if you continue to program with Python, you'll see a bunch of this, and it'll make more sense as it goes on. Um, more questions? No, we good? Cool. Alright, so there's a bunch of demo code today. I've got some demo code for sprite animations as well because they're cute and everyone loves sprites. Um, so for homework, go ahead and try and package your code nicely into a module. So just try and like collect everything and try and make it easily importable. Um, try to make classes for your animations or your games or whatever you're doing with Pygame. Just try and get that going. And uh, are there any other questions before I start going over some sample code? No? Cool. All right, sample code. No. Oh. Code. Then do you guys want to go over the sprite example first or the Pong example? Pong. Pong. All right, so Python. What's up? Yes. Generally, it does not have to be empty. It's to let Python know that this is a package versus a regular folder. So Python will treat that folder differently because it sees that init file in it. There are like clever things you can do with that init file, but that's all like voodoo that folks do. Uh, you won't see much of that often. All right, cool. So Pong with classes. Ooh. Right? So this is Pong. It actually works now. I mean, there's no score counter, but you know, there's a ball, there's two paddles. I'm controlling both of them right now. It's pretty great. Um, and the ball just doesn't bounce back and forth, which is really exciting. And you can close it, and it doesn't crash your computer. Awesome. Right? So in this code, you'll notice that there's, it looks uh, really nice, actually. Huh, cool. So there's going to be th uh, two main classes and a loop, right, cool. So in this code, there are two main classes. There's a paddle class, there's a ball class. At the top of the file, we do a bunch of, um, we do a bunch of housekeeping stuff, create some global variables that'll be used throughout the game, and then we go ahead and uh, start our game loop. So from the top, we're importing pygame, sys, and random. random 
is what random sounds like. You can look up the documentation online. We'll cover it next class. Um, it creates random numbers. Um, that's all it does. That's how we're going to use it. From pygame.local import star. You've seen this before. Notice how you can separate different things you want to import with a comma. That works fine. You can do the same for importing when you're not using a wildcard. If you wanted to import specific things, you can separate that with a comma, and it will understand that. Um, we have global variables for our screen width, our screen height, and our frames per second. And we do this fun magic incantation that we've do been doing for a long time. We do the pygame.init. We create a new clock um, so we can have a constant frame rate. We go ahead and create a new screen with our given screen width and screen height. And then we cr uh, change the caption on that screen. Um, cool. Any questions there about defining all those global variables or setting a pie game? We're good there? Cool. Um, so the next thing that's going on in this is we're defining two classes, right? The first class that's there is the paddle class, which represents a player paddle for a game of Pong. Um, keeps track of the position, the velocity, and the color of the paddle. It handles control of the paddle and collision detection as well. So our init function just sets the XY position of the paddle, and it sets the color, and that's it. Um, we see down here that the width and height are set standard. So they're always going to be 10 wide and 100 units tall. And we see that the speed is always going to be 10. Right? That's not an argument that you can pass to the paddles. That's just set for all paddles. We set paddle up to equal paddle down to equal false. So both paddle up and paddle down are going to equal false after that statement. You can chain things together like that if you want. It's shorthand. It's kind of lazy and a little confusing to look at. But again, it's something people do, and we just wanted to do it so you guys could see what it looks like. Any questions on that weird assignment line? We're OK with the two equals thing? Why? Because paddle up needs to have the same value as paddle down. So we can just set paddle up equal to paddle down and paddle down equal to false. It's just like a chain of doing those things. It's to save space. It's a style thing. There's no particular reason why you would do this over something like, hmm? False. False is a Boolean. It means. This is what I'm saying. What's up? When you start it out, it's not moving up or down. Correct. It's in place. Oh. But why is false? What's the value? False is defining like if there's a paddle up event, like if, if there's no paddle up event, then it's false, right? If there's a paddle up event, then it's true. Why Based on the event, on them? whether or not there's You'll see event. later on why it's defined because it's it, it's being used later. This mm -hmm. is just telling you what <coughs> what properties you want a paddle to have. And one of them is whether it's going up or down. And at the beginning, when you create it, it's not doing either. So you want to make sure that the program knows it's not doing either. Start up. Later on you'll see. We're just trying to give ourselves placeholders for conditionals later on so that we can use an if statement and have it work later. But before we're, we can actually do that, we need to have some like standard value, some like known state that we're in. And you could call it cheeseburger and hamburger, but it's easier to think of it paddle up, paddle down, the way it's being used in this program later. Why? Helping or hurting? How can you say I think we get it. I just Cool. Yeah, please. Um, if, you, is it, if you have a new thing with an undefined uh, if variable and if it's undefined, is that an error? Uh, no, it's false. It's false. What, do, what do you mean by undefined? Uh, if you haven't defined it as false, and then you say if have up. So if we do Python, so if we do if, so if we have foo, yeah. but we don't define foo yeah. ever in our program, then it's going to error. Because if we do if foo, right, yeah. uh, print yay, that's going to error because it has no idea what foo is. Foo has never been used before in the program. If we do a foo equals none, which you can do, 
Uh, and we do an if foo uh, print yay. It won't print yay because none equals false. Okay. So you, right. So you're basically never have really undefined variables. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, undefined variables are things that you'd find in languages like C, static languages, static strongly typed languages. So you'd need to like define the space for the variable before using it. Since Python is dynamic, you can just create variables on the fly and just go with it. Cool. Yeah, let me know. Undefined reference? Mm, I don't know if it's that. We're trying to assign something before. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what that is. Cool. So, uh, at the end of the init function, we draw the pedal on the screen, just so it's there, so we can actually have visual confirmation that the pedal has been created. Um, no need to do that there. It's just a nicety. Um, we have another couple of functions which sets the pedal up to be whatever value is. Oh yeah, set pedal. So set pedal sets uh, the pedal movement boolean to be true. And then we have a stop pedal which says stop moving. Um, so we set pedal up to mean it goes up until we set pedal stop. So we're stop. still within the same class. This is all the same class. It's indented, yes. And remember that classes are not just giving you properties of these things. They're also giving you the behaviors that are possible in these things. So the paddle behaviors are just as impossible the fact, as the fact that there is a paddle. Cool. We have to have a way of setting the, 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 the behavior of that paddle, whether it's going up or down. That's what the set paddle is. So if we look at the update function within the pedal, we can see uh, actual pedal movement, which is exciting. So if the paddle's y position is greater than zero, and self paddle dot or self dot paddle up is true, then we go ahead and we move our paddle up by uh, ten units or whatever dy was. Just by putting it there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we're saying, well, we're kind of explicitly saying that because we say if self.y is greater than zero here, and then we have this and statement saying that this second part also needs to be true. You're saying there's no equal sign true. Right, right. We could do this, and that would be the same thing. Right, that's what I'm saying. Yes. And so at the top, you have the self. Right after all the variables, you just go mm -hmm. Yes. But that will become clear in a second. Correct. We haven't seen the draw function yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this update function basically checks to see whether or not we're supposed to be moving up. If we are supposed to be moving up, then we move ourselves up a little bit. The whole way we check that is through the paddle up variable. Um, uh, similarly, for paddle down, we check to see if we should be moving downwards, and then we move down. Movement should look uh, relatively familiar to you guys. We played with movement, and zero zero is the upper left-hand corner. Remember, so when we're um, moving up, we have to subtract from the y direction as opposed to add to it. So it's a little backwards, but yeah, that's the way that works. Um, any questions on update? It makes more sense when you actually see the game loop, so you can actually see how these things are being called rather than how they're defined. Um, but I'd just like to cover them really quick before I start showing you guys that sort of thing. Cool. Now we have this draw function. All it does is uh, draw a rectangle on the screen, and it saves that rectangle in self.bounding box. So when you do a pygame.drawRect, call, it will both draw that to the screen and return to you a rectangle. Um, we store that rectangle later for, for later use, for collision detection and things like that. Um, right. 
first self dot bounding box coming from just Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can uh, define you can define variables on the fly within classes or within functions. That's just a Python thing you can do. Um, so you don't need to define everything and variables in the object in the object. No, you don't. You can define them wherever, mm -hmm. which is another design decision that uh, has very interesting implications in terms of scope. Things that I'm not going to talk about, but it does have like very interesting computer science implications. Um, what's up? Uh, but you do have to, I mean, this is an uh, uh, implementation variable within a function that has been defined in the uh, up top. So it was called. Already, I mean, not defined, but it's already been called. set aside, right? Called? What's the word? So in the init function, we call self.draw. Oh, self. Okay. Mm -hmm. so yeah. And when self.draw is called, it creates a space called self.bounding box if it was not there initially, and stores a rectangle within that. Does that make sense? What's up? Um, instead of paddle up and paddle down, uh, why did you go with that instead of having like paddle up down or We wanted an easy way to process events, so when you uh, play with the keyboard itself, when you like hold the up button down, you only get one event for that. You only get a key down event. So we wanted some sort of a couple of state variables so we know whether or not this is being depressed, whether or not we've released it, things like that. Because, you know, if we just like held it down and we had like, if we implemented this some other way, we actually implemented it in, in a simpler way the first time we did this, but when we held up, the paddle wouldn't move up. It would only move up like 10 pixels and then it would stop moving. So in order to combat that, we created these state variables in order to deal with that. Does that answer your question? Why would his way be less optimized for this? Hmm? I mean, his way, the way he, 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 the example he gave, why would that be a worse way of implementing I'd have to see it on paper. I don't know that it is or it isn't right off the top of my head. Cool. So that's the paddle. We got set paddle up, set paddle down, stop paddle up, stop paddle down. We have update and we have draw, right? All of those things create one paddle object. Uh, the next class we have is a ball. The ball is really relatively simple. It's got um, an init function that requires no arguments. You still need to have the self even if the init function is not going to have any other arguments. Um, all it does is set the ball's radius to 10, set the color to blue, uh, resets its position to the center of the screen, and then draws it on the screen. Um, if we look at the reset function, all that does is it changes the x and the y position, and it changes the uh, velocity of the ball to a random integer between negative 3 and 3, or negative 6 and 6. Uh, for x and y, respectively. Right. Um, so in Python 3, you don't need to worry about that. All division in Python 3 will automatically turn integers into floating point numbers, period. Um, if you are doing uh, math in Python 2.7, you need to be careful because if you do uh, an integer divided by an integer, you will get an integer out of that. You can also do from future import star, um, or from future import division, and that will allow you to do Python 3 style division. Hit talk, hold the key button, you can let it go, and then hit the talk button again. Um, and those are the ways you get around that. But yeah, it's just something to be aware of. Python does do integer division, and it will it will so break things. So drops the remainder? Yeah. I have I ordered pizza and breadsticks, and now I'm doing that, but I'm on the bike, so I can't take it with me. So you guys are welcome to <laughs> meal wow. lovers pizza and garlic breadsticks. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. We have a nice trip. Yeah. Cool.
So the reset function just moves the ball to the center of the screen and uh, sets the x speed and the y speed to random numbers, just so the Pong game will actually be kind of fun. Um, the update position. Uh, the update function updates the position of the ball. It moves itself in the x and the y directions. Um, and yeah, it checks to see whether or not it's bouncing off of the top or the bottom of the screen or the sides. Uh, I haven't implemented score checking, but that's all this is doing. This is doing basic collision detection with the edges of the screen. Um, right. So if it hits the left or the right hand side of the screen, it's going to reset the ball back to the center of the screen. And if it hits the top or the bottom, it is going to just change directions as it should. Cool. And we also have a, a check collisions function within our ball. And this does a collision detection thing that's built into Pygame Rectangles. There's a method within Pygame Rectangles to get uh, colliding rectangles to see whether or not things are colliding. So you do a, a self.boundingbox.collidedRect and then give it a, uh, an object that you want to see whether or not it's colliding with. And that just automatically returns to you a true or a false depending on whether or not those things are intersecting. Um, and if it is intersecting, we just change its x direction. So it bounces away from the pedal. Can you talk a, a little about how, why can you just use paddle.bounding box in that function? That why can I just use, uh, this is, remember we were mentioning that all data types are public, or all data members are public within Python? And uh, the bounding box is a data member that was created within the draw function. So once the paddle is drawn to screen, we store its position in the variable called self.bounding box. This is just giving you access to that same function contained within the class. Exactly. Yeah, paddle is an argument to check collision. I'm sorry I didn't say that out loud, but that is what's going on there. So we pass we pass a paddle to check collisions so the ball knows what paddle to check against. What's up? What is the difference between self.bounding box and paddle.bounding box? All right. So when you're within a class structure, you want to be using self. Uh, paddle, in this case, lowercase p paddle. That is an object, not a class, right? So we have created a paddle already, and this paddle has a bounding box. The way you would get at that paddle's bounding box is by doing paddle.bounding box. But when you're in a class defining all of the data members that are going to be contained within that class, you need to use self. So again, this is the blueprint versus like the house sort of a thing. When you have a house, you can just find the bathroom. But when you have a blueprint, you actually need to like look up where the bathroom or where the restroom is within that blueprint sort of a thing. You're only going to see self within the definition of a class. That's it. Where's the ball in all of this, though? Like, how are you checking the bounding box against itself? The ball is self. The ball is the self ball in is this self. case. Yes, because we're in a different class Very now. Bad. We are no longer in the paddle class. We're in the ball class. So self now refers to the ball. Cool. All right. And then one last function here, and we have draw, which draws the ball. Exactly how you think it would. Um, when you draw a circle, it returns to a rectangle. Pretty exciting, right? Yeah. The rectangle is the smallest rectangle that can fit that circle that you just drew. So you can use that for collision detection. Um, and we're doing the same thing here. We're storing our circle's bounding box in a, in a variable within the class called bounding box. The fact that we're not talking about a ball. So it's like, it's how are you checking if the paddle collides with the paddle? That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Right, yeah, it'd be nicer if we could fit more code on one screen, but I wanted to enlarge the text for the videos. Any other questions on balls? No? We're good? Great. <laughs> cool. So at the heart of our game, we have our game loop, and this is where all the actual magic happens. We're, this is where we're going to be using our paddles and the ball. What's up? Can you go back up to the draw? Sure. Also, 
Yes. Yeah, yeah. So the the circle, the draw dot circle function, um, has a side effect. It draws to the screen, but it also returns to you the bounding box of that circle. So it returns to you the smallest possible rectangle that will fit that circle. So it does two things at once. One of them just happens to happen on the screen, and the other one happens in code. Good question, though. Sure. Yeah, we don't have to store that, but we want to store it because we want to be able to do collision detection. We good there? Cool. So in the game loop, what we're doing here is we're creating two paddles, right? We have player one and pl player two, and we just do that by instantiating two new paddle classes, right? So we create two paddle objects using the big P and then passing in some arguments. Um, those arguments are the x, y positions of each one of the paddles. And in the case of player two, we're also passing it a color, so there's going to be red and green. And we're calling those objects, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Player one is an object, player two is an object, a paddle is, is a class. An instance of a class. Exactly. <laughs> you got it. An object is an instance of a class. Yep. We're creating a ball. Notice here that the ball takes no arguments. It is what it is. Um, we create a background just so we can blank the screen really easy. Um, we fill that black background with black. Um, and wall true, this is the game itself. Everything contained within the wall true loop is actually the game logic. Um, so first thing we do is we get all of the events, like we did last class, where we do a pygame.event.get. That's going to give us everything. We're going to iterate over that using a for loop. For event in pygame.event.get. If the <coughs> event type is quit, so if you click that X in the upper left-hand corner, it's going to exit this game. Um, if it's a key down uh, event type, it's going to check what key is being pressed down. If W is being pressed down, then it's setting the uh, paddle to player one's paddle to move upward. If it is S, then it's going to set player's one paddle to move down. If it is up, it's going to set player 2's pedal to move up, and if it's down, it's going to set player 2's two, pedal to move down. So we're calling, the, uh, if this is true, then we're calling this method. Exactly. Mm -hmm. okay. The player one dot set pedal up method. Yes, which takes no arguments, and all it does is it flips that Boolean value within the, within the class itself. Um, we also check for key up events. And this is where why we have the both the stop functions and the set functions. So if you let go of the the up arrow, it's going to set that variable to false. So the pedal will no longer be moving in the up or down direction. It'll just be stopped. Right. So that's how we handle events. There's probably a nicer way we could do this, but it looks relatively clean. Uh, we black the background. We go ahead and update the player one's paddle position, update player two's paddle position, then we check for collisions using the method that's associated with the ball. So we ask the ball whether or not it's colliding with player one's paddle, ask the ball whether or not it's colliding with player two's paddle, and then we update the ball's position. So if the ball was colliding with player one, it'll change some of the ball state. It'll tell it to reverse x direction, right? And then when we call update, it's actually going to move the ball before we draw it. And then after we do all the complicated let's try and figure out where everything goes math, we draw everything to the screen. And we go ahead and click the clock and we display everything. And that's, that is our Pong game. That's it in its entirety using classes and functions and methods and all that good stuff. Sorry, what's this last thing? You're going to see this in the wild. Um, this says that uh, a Python script is, a Python file is a script that can be run, right? So when you call a Python script from the command line, it sets a variable within your Python program, underscore, underscore name, to be equal to main. Okay. That's all that's saying. So when we call this from the command line, it runs it. So if we didn't have that, or if we were importing this, um, this module, so what is this called? Um, if we were importing Pong with classes, so we could do import Pong with classes, 
and it would check to see whether or not name equaled main. If name equaled main, it would start the game, but it doesn't in this case because we're just importing things. Then we could have access to the paddles and the ball and even the game loop if we wanted it, and it would like allow us to manipulate things that way. So it's actually a cool way that you can both call this as a script or import it, and it won't break your code if you import it. Any other questions about the game loop? What's going on here? It's really cool to like actually get more text on your screen and go through it slowly, line by line. Uh, nothing too complicated is going on here. There's definitely a ton of improvements that can be made, so feel free to have fun with that. Correct. Which well, particular right here. From pygame.locals import star. Pygame.locals contains a bunch of uh, constants, like a k underscore w, for example. And when we import all of those, we get them within our program. Numbers. Constants. They're numbers. Yeah, so KW uh, corresponds to a number for the W button on your keyboard. I don't know what Pygame thinks that is. But yeah, it's just a number. Um, actually, we could do Python from Pygame.locals import star uh, K up. So the up button is button 273. That's what you get. They're numbers. They correspond to something, I assume. I don't really know what it is. What's up? What, was it just quit? 12. Great. What about clock? Clock is a variable we defined within our, um, within our code. So if we go back to our code, we can see clock is being created right here. Any other questions about Pong? And it, it was capitalized why? Because it's a global variable. Because we use it wherever we want to, and yeah. When dealing with global variables, it's nice to give yourself some visual cue that they are global and that they should, you should be wary of them. Any other questions? No? Great. Cool. Um, one more uh, piece of code for today. We have this really fun, I went online, so I was building a series of video games for this uh, video game diary project I was working on, where I was making my life into a series of mini games, just because I think it'd be funny. Um, and I was working with sprites to like animate, to do like 8-bit animations and stuff, and they all come on sheets like this, right? So you have this sheet, it's broken out into like little characters every place. And then these little characters, when you move them frame by frame, create some sort of animation. So what I was doing in using Pygame for a long time was creating a little, some helper classes to help me animate things on sprite sheets. So we see we have this little dude who's walking around. It's not very exciting. That's really all he does. But yeah. This is true. This is true. This is like, yeah, this is a can sprite. Um, yeah. I, I think I stole it from Final Fantasy or something like that. I don't remember where I stole it from. Uh, I do. Not here. I think our special treat. All right. I'll see what I can do. I, I don't know where it is at the moment. This is a project I have not worked on in a long time. But I'll see what I can do. Um, so in this function, or in this piece of code, we've got a couple of functions in here. We've got a load image function. I'm just going to run through it really quick to see what's here. We have a split image function. And we have an animated sprite. How does it get rid of the background? Well, it doesn't. So if we look, sprite example, if you look really closely like where this little dude's arms are, you can see the remnants of the previous uh, animation frames. I see. Yeah, so it, it's sloppy and there are like better ways to do this, but I was just fooling around. Um, cool. Is it, it's a rectangle then? Mm -hmm. 
Yep, they're all rectangles. They're all similarly sized rectangles too, which is nice. The PNG that you got had a bunch of them, and I guess they're indexed, and that's how you access them. They are not indexed. You have to slice them by hand. You do? Mm-hmm, yeah. So you just figured out how big each one was? Yep, that's exactly what I did. So I went in and I like measured it by pictures. No, 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 no. All right, so let's go over the code, because yeah. I did it all in code. Sweet. So there are three things going on in this code. There is a load image function, which pulls an image out of uh, my hard disk into Pygame, so I can start displaying it to the screen. There's a split image thing, which does the snipping for me. So I can like tell it where the sprites are and snip it so I have like three different frames of animation, so I can get the little walking animation thing going. And then I have an animated sprite class, which allows me to make a sprite dance on screen. Um, so the first thing that goes on is the load, well, let's go to main first. Let's try this instead. Cool. So this is the main function. What we do here is we start Pygame, as per the usual, create a screen. We load our character sheet, which has all of our little sprites on it. That pulls it from disk into Pygame. We go ahead and split that sheet into multiple images using the split image function, which is defined within this file. Um, we create a clock, as per the usual. We create a sprite with an animated sprite group. Um, there is, like, Pygame does lots of things with sprites to help you optimize how fast they move, so you can have, like, more than four on the screen without slowing your computer down. So sometimes you have to deal with their proprietary stuff, in this case, we have sprite groups. Um, this one just happens to be a group of one object, but that's just the way you do sprites in Pygame. Um, so while true, this is again our game loop, basically. We take the clock, we um, update our sprite image, we go ahead and draw the sprite to screen, and we flip the display, and we check to see whether or not we're getting a quit event. Uh, unclear. I'm not sure. Um, yeah. Cool. So let's check out this load image thing. What is it doing here? Uh, cool. Right. So this function right here, this is a doc string. I remember mentioning this three double quote thing to you guys, but never actually like showing it to you in code. This is what's called a doc string. This is how you define it. The lines immediately after your definition line, you can hold triple quote quoted strings, and those strings will be used for a help function later on. So if you call help from your terminal, or from your shell, you will be able to see whatever is contained within that block of text. Um, cool. So the first thing we do is we try to load the image, and if we can't, just break the program. Um, try and accept are things that we have not talked about. Nah. I will add that to next week's class, just because it's something I forgot to talk about. They're, they're a way of handling errors within Python. So when things start to go wrong, you can like catch these errors so it doesn't prevent, or it prevents your program from completely crashing. Um, so the first thing we do is we load an image um, using Pygame image load. If we can't load it, we crash this, the program, so it just fails. Um, we convert the image from like a PNG, in this case, into some native format that Pygame likes, so we can display it super fast. Um, we figure out a color key. So the color key is how we know to get rid of the background. Basically, we have that ugly green color on the sprite sheet right here. And if we provide that as a color key to this um, function, what it does is it uses that ugly green color to like it just wipes out anything that is that ugly green color in general. Exactly, that's precisely what it does. Yep. So it'll just like, so it'll just alpha all of that crap out. So anything that's ugly green will just be completely transparent and then we can like move on. Yeah. Um, we are. The color key is, yeah, so it's taking that green and it's making it transparent. Where is that green there? Start with it. Yeah, you can. You can start with a transparent PNG. That's totally fine. No reason not to. Where is that green? 
Uh, the green is this color key thing, which is an argument that is being passed here. Right, so it's a keyword argument that's being passed in load image. Where are we <laughs> calling it? What, what color? Where, are where is that green being defined? Where, how does it know that? And what's the RGB value? Where is the RGB value of that green anywhere in here? Is it over in the library or RGB? Oh, check this out. So if we don't pass it as an argument, I did this because I was being clever. If we don't pass it as an argument, it takes the upper left hand most pixel oh. in the image and it grabs whatever color that is and uses it as That's a chroma key. What That's what messed me up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this color key line right here yeah. is doing that. It's oh. getting the pixel at zero, zero. It's using that and it's using that as alpha and yeah. like getting rid of everything there. Yeah, so if you don't pass it a ugly green RGB value, it will automatically detect whatever it is within your sprite sheet, which is kind of nice. Um, so once we're done with that, we just return the image. This is now the image with the uh, ugly green transparents. So it's just like the sprites and a bunch of transparent background. Um, split image takes a surface, which in this case is the image with all the sprites on it, uh, a point at which to start, like an XY position, uh, the number of columns and rows you want. So we can have like, in this case, we were only getting the top three. So we were getting uh, one row of three columns. Um, does that make sense? We're just grabbing these top three dudes right here. And then we're specifying the width and the height of each one of these uh, sprites. And we basically break it out into a list. Uh, What's up? My rows four. Yeah. Um, zero, zero, three, four, thirty-two, forty-eight. Zero, zero. Columns. Because it's the zeroth row, row of the. Remember how computer scientists love to count from zero, right? The row that is it's on is the zeroth row. So I misspoke there. Um, so we want row zero. And then this is row one and row two, so we want row zero through uh, column up three. And you'll see a four, and that's what she's asking about. Scroll up, and I will see a four. S up, you said? Are we sure about that? Uh, I'm sorry, sorry, no, down. Down, all right. Okay. Split image. Yeah, there. Right. So we got zero, zero is the yeah. position in which we start. Three is the oh, columns. Four, Four is, rows. is rows. Hmm. Man, it has been so long since I've looked at this code. Um, this is why you leave yourself comments. <laughs> Did you write those comments when you were writing it originally? Yes. I did. Um, I don't know. I'll have to look into that further to see what's going on there. I'm going to punt that one for now. Um, so this function basically iterates over the rows, iterates over the columns, and snips that uh, image surface into each individual sprite frames, basically. And once it's done, it returns the list of images that are going to be within your animation. This animated sprite class uh, takes a list of images. It takes ticks for like how long to switch between each image and a position. So you can display it at a certain position on the screen, as well as a list of groups. That's something you just, the star groups thing is some like magic you have to do for Pygame. Um, so I might have missed this, but where are you, where's the image rendered from? Upper left hand corner. So, how do you set the offset? If it's like at the position of your screen, you have to calculate how wide your image is. Yeah. Mm hmm. Um, so, there's some like voodoo in here, like this super thing is something that I didn't really want to go into. Uh, classes can contain methods from other classes, and to do this, you use something called inheritance. So, you can have like a mammal, and a subclass of that would be a dog. So like a dog would have similar features to a mammal, like you know it has hair, and uh, 
the yeah doing the super call is basically saying that like all right whatever's above me i i'm grabbing the features of whatever that is and applying it to myself um what are you applying to here that's not in the class that you're dealing with why do you have to use super because right here this like open paren thing going on yeah uh that is saying that this animated sprite class is inheriting features from the Pygame sprite class. So we're going to contain similar functionality and stuff to that super class. When we say the, when we do the super call, that just sets everything up. Same thing when you use the object, everything that you put object in that parentheses. Exactly. Inheriting. Bingo. Gadget. Yeah, the only difference is you don't need to call the super function. You can just ignore that. Mm -hmm. Right. So this takes a bunch of images. It takes ticks. It has a counter, a position, and an image to start on, um, like a current image counter. When you call update, it takes its internal clock once. It checks to see whether or not it should update the image. And if it should, it resets the tick counter. It adds one to the um, position counter for the image and it sets the image placeholder as the new image. This magic modulo len thing is just a way for me to count up and have it like repeat so I can go like one two three one two three one two three as opposed to like counting just up or doing doing any other weird if statements there. Where did that come from? Hmm? The modulo oh, len oh, is oh, the oh, percent oh, sign. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And that's all that does. The rest of the sprite class is hidden behind the scenes within the pygame.sprite sprite class. Um, yeah. So this is kind of hand wavy. Um, I definitely suggest checking out this code, playing around with it, see what you can get it to do. And go online and read about pygame sprites. That'll definitely make things clearer in that regard. This is just a cool demo because it shows some things and it gives some good points. Uh, if you combine some of the paddle code with the sprite code, you can move your sprite around? Yeah. There's no reason you can't move your sprite around. Yeah. You could have a little walking. Yeah. <laughs> or you could have the walking fellow being hit by paddles. That's fine. Shoot fireballs. Yeah. Why not? Um, yeah, so this is just a, it's a, it's a little springboard, so you, there's like try and accept things in here, there's some inheritance, there's some pie game stuff, so if you go over this code in your own time, it's going to be super valuable if you actually try and like sit down and grok it. Um, other than that, I'm about done for tonight. So next class we're going to cover um, standard library functionality, like uh, random and math and things that you need to do when programming. Um, we're also going to cover uh, exceptions, because that's something I did not, I neglected to cover this time around. Um, and that will be the final class. Any other questions or concerns or anything like that for tonight? Huh? Question Thank you for teaching us. Oh, yeah. Don't forget to bring the Brad Spike for next class. All right. So I'll see what I can do. What's up? I'm just curious. How do you do when you define the, either the functions or the methods of a class or Methods. Um, you do anything different if they're going to return values? No. no. You just have a return at the end of the function. You get to return as long as not tuple. You get to return whatever you want. It does not matter what you return. You can return. If you want to return multiple things, then you would just return a tuple. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. Cool. Well, thanks for stopping by. I'll see you guys next week. Toodles.